Hi guys, it's been two and a half weeks since Putin started an unprovoked war against Ukraine with the official goal of denazification and demilitarization. The theory that Ukraine is occupied by the Nazi regime is ridiculous, but it's extremely popular in Russia. We don't have any good statistics, but it seems like at least 50% of Russian population buys that crap, at least partially. Unfortunately, the theory gains some momentum internationally, and some people legitimately ask, why the Ukrainian battalion Azov fighting in Mariupol has neo-Nazi symbols? Maybe Ukraine is indeed neo-Nazi state and US is hiding the truth. This is quite complex but exciting topic for everyone who loves to deconstruct propaganda. And it's an amazing example how totally fake narrative can be constructed out of two simple things. Misinterpretation of real facts and constant repetition. This video basically has two parts. First, the origin of propaganda, which is related to the Ukrainian nationalism around World War II. And the second one, the current propaganda, which is based on that origin. I apologize that the first part is a bit too long, so take a seat and drink some tea or coffee while listening. The whole Russian narrative, in short, is based around the guy named Stepan Bandera, who was a Ukrainian nationalist, fascist and Hitler collaborationist. He was killed in 1959 by NKVD, but there are a bunch of followers of him in Western Ukraine who are neo-Nazi. Apparently, for the last eight years, they were secretly controlling the Ukrainian government. Their goal is to kill and discriminate against every Russian-speaking Ukrainian, and they are responsible for the genocide in Donbas. Well, it is true that Bandera was a Nazi, and there are some people in Ukraine who considered him as a national hero. But the rest of the story is just not true. To prove that, first I need to give you some important historical context. Before the First World War, Ukrainian speakers were divided between the Russian and Austro-Hungarian empires. Culturally speaking, there was a huge gap between Eastern illiterate Ukrainian from Russia and Western enlightened Ukrainians from Austro-Hungary. When the First World War ended in 1918, both empires collapsed and dozens of new European nations were created, like Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Hungary and many others. Ukrainians wanted to create their own state as well and declared the Ukrainian People's Republic in the Russian part. The country managed to survive for two years, but then it was annexed by the Soviet Union, creating a Ukrainian Soviet Socialistic Republic out of it. In the West, Ukrainian speakers' land were mostly added to the newly created independent Poland. Some Ukrainians didn't like that and started to fight with Poland for independence. So-called Ukrainian-Polish War. But after half a year, Ukrainian side lost it. Basically, there was no more Ukrainian state in 1920. And Ukrainian speakers were divided among the Soviet Union, Poland and tiny parts in Romania and Czechoslovakia. In 1929, in Vienna, Austria, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, OUN, was created, with the prime goal to establish an independent Ukraine on the land of eastern Poland, with the capital in Lviv. And yep, the ideology of that envisioned state had nothing to do with democracy and was openly fascist. Most likely, OUN was originally created by Germany to destabilize the situation in Poland, but there is no clear proof of that. Stepan Bandera was a prominent member of OUN and it was a leader of it since 1940. Now, it's important to say that OUN had three different stages of its development, which are completely different in terms of ideology, organization and the real power. Stage 1. The youth. If you look at the language map of interwar Poland based on the census of 1931, you can see that Eastern Poland, which is currently Western Ukraine, was predominantly Ukrainian speaking. And it kind of makes sense to create an independent state. But it is more complicated. And there is one problem. The map doesn't show you the density of population. Most of villagers indeed were Ukrainians, but all the cities were predominantly Polish with second ethnicity being Yiddish speaking Jews. Ukrainians were only the third one. For example, the largest city Lviv, or in Polish Lvov, was 50% Catholic Polish speaker, 32% Jews, both Yiddish and Polish speaker, and only 11% of Orthodox Ukrainian. Very similar situation were in all other cities, and the percentage of Ukrainian speakers were at most 20%. If you look at the overall percentage of Ukrainian by four regions of Eastern Poland, it is clear that Ukrainian had plurality, but not the majority with an exception of one region. And considering very small percentage of them in the city, any political solution for independent Western Ukraine was practically impossible. The only thing the organization of Ukrainian nationalists can do at that stage was terrorism. Members of OUN were assassinating Polish officials and Ukrainians who were collaborating with them. 
and they were too minor and irrelevant to notice until the assassination of the Minister of Internal Affairs Bronislav Piratsky in 1934. Stepan Bandera was tried for involvement in assassination plot and convicted for terrorism and got a life sentence in prison. This could be the end of OUN's story, but it's just the end of stage one. In October 1939, Poland was occupied and divided by Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. All Ukrainian-speaking regions went to the Soviet Union and were merged with the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. Dictator Stalin decided to solve the Polish question in Western Ukraine and deported all Polish-speaking city population to the Siberia. This was extremely cruel, but it was welcomed by OUN members, because now they can think about real Ukrainian state. But there was a second problem. Jews, who lived in all cities of Western Ukraine and outnumbered the Ukrainian residents. With the Nazi occupation of West Poland, many more Jews fled as refugees to East Poland, Western Ukraine making Jews a majority in the cities. And Stalin welcomed Jews contrary to Hitler. From the OUN perspective, Ukraine must be for Ukrainians, meaning that Jews must be out as well, and the government must be fascist, not communist. Hitler's program was pretty much aligned with that goal, and Stepan Bandera was freed from the prison in Nazi-occupied Poland. We don't know the details, but we can guess what happened. This marks the beginning of stage two of OUN, the maturity. OUN decided to openly side with Nazi Germany and received 2.5 millions of Deutsche Marks for subversive activities inside the Soviet Union. Hitler was planning to attack the Soviet Union starting with Western Ukraine in 1941. Bandera, who was a leader of one of the wing of OUN, had a bizarre idea to convince Hitler that OUN is not just a terrorist organization but the real political power. And instead of occupation Ukraine, Hitler should create an independent Nazi Ukraine state, making Bandera a local Führer. On June 30, 1941, where Hitler forces arrived to Lviv, Bandera declared a newly independent Ukrainian state and himself as an absolute leader of it, reassuring a great collaboration with Nazi Germany in further liberation of the world. In the proposed constitution of that newly created state, the national policy was simple. Ukraine is for Ukrainians. All the remaining Polish peasants must be taught that they are actually Ukrainians but were converted to Catholicism. For Jews, there were no any expectation of Ukrainianization, so they all must be deported. On the same day, OUN did a huge anti-Jewish pogrom, killing 2,000 Jews in one day. It looked nothing like a regular pogrom, but rather a multi-day feast with celebration with blood and screams of innocent Jewish people, to show that OUN and Hitler are great allies. However, the leadership of Nazi Germany was completely shocked and surprised of these events. Not that they had anything against killing the Jews, but declaring independent states on the territory which was liberated by German soldiers? What? That weird act of Bandera was considered a coup. The Ukrainian state managed to exist for several days and then German authorities came and stopped the party. Bandera was arrested and eventually sent to VIP prison called Zellenbau because Nazi wanted to keep OUN loyal to them but assumed that Bandera can make another coup in Ukraine so it's better to keep a close eye on him. Basically, after that, Bandera is no longer relevant in history. The rest of OUN members formed a military branch of UPA, Ukrainian Insurgent Army, who were responsible for massive ethnic cleansing. The most horrible of them was the Volyn massacre in 1943, where 100,000 ethnically Polish peasants were killed by UPA. Also, it's highly probable that UPA is partially responsible for Holocaust in Western Belarus, but there is no official proof. It's important to note that UPA was still a relatively small organization, the size of it in 1943 with around 15 to 20,000, which is only 1% out of several millions of Ukrainians living in the Western Ukraine. That was no way a dominant ideology among regular population, and we have a countless example of regular Ukrainians hiding Poles from UPA murderers as well as Jews from Nazi SS. This is the end of stage 2 of OUN. The Soviet Union defeated Nazi Germany in 1944 and took back the whole territory of Ukraine. OUN and UPA had a major rebranding which marks beginning of the stage 3, old age. This time, the size of UPA increased 10 times. 
Mostly, these were young people who were afraid of being conscripted into the Soviet army. With that size increase by people who had zero Nazi agenda, OUN completely changed its ideology. Killing of ethnic Poles and Jews were outlawed. And non-ethnic Ukrainians were allowed to join. For example, there were a bunch of Russian speakers who joined UPA back then. The main goal now was to fight against the Soviet occupation and create a strong guerrilla movement. That was a very different stage of OUN, free of ethnic cleansing and the idea that Ukraine is a fascist state. These guys managed to resist until 1956. This was a very long story to show you that OUN slash UPA were quite a different organization in different times. Now let's look at the contemporary assessment of Bandera movement by Poland, Ukraine and Russia. Poland has the most fair assessment. OUN slash UPA were Ukrainian Nazi who were responsible for death of 100,000 Poles in Volin. Bandera, although not directly involved in that, can be hero for anyone because he was the formal leader of that organization. Ukrainian assessment is quite weird. Basically, only a good part of the story matters. Bandera wanted to create an independent Ukraine and later his followers fought against the Soviet occupation. Bandera was not a Nazi because he was sent to the concentration camp, uh, which is formally true because that VIP prison in Tilenbao was located in the concentration camp. Volin massacres, Bandera was not involved, which is formally true, and it was an ethnic cleansing on both sides. Ukrainians were killed by Polish as well, which is formally true, but the magnitude of killing is just not comparable. I would compare Stepan Bandera to George Floyd, who was criminal, drug addict and made an aggravated assault against pregnant women. If you ask any BLM members about Floyd, they will all tell you that it's all lies and he was an innocent black man who died because of evil police. If someone supports George Floyd, it doesn't mean he or she supports drug addictions and aggravated assaults, they just care about police injustice. The same is true for Ukrainian supporters of Stepan Bandera. It's a perfect example of postmodernist truth. As a person who knows history, I find it completely disgusting any glorification of Bandera, but it's clear that 99% of Bandera supporters are not supporting any Nazi narrative and they only care about good part of that evil person. Final remark, Bandera is only viewed positively by 32% of Ukrainians according to the poll still a minority. The last assessment is Russian, which is the weirdest one. They don't care or even know about the mass killing of ethnic Poles. Instead, they only care about late stage of Bandera movement and claim that it was not a struggle against Soviet regime, but a Nazi movement to destroy Russian speakers in Ukraine. Basically, they combine stage two with stage three in the ugliest way possible. This strange theory of Russian speakers being targets was popular since Soviet times and many Russians were afraid to go to Western Ukraine because they assumed that the Bandera's guerrilla movement was still there, ready to kill them for their ethnicity. Now it's time for part two, the current state of Russian propaganda. I promise it's gonna be shorter. So, after the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia and Ukraine became two different countries, but Russia still wanted to hold certain political power in Ukraine. From 1993 to 2005, Ukraine had the most boring president, Leonid Kuchma. He looks like retard, he behaved like retard. He was kind of pro-Russian, but still promised that Ukraine would join EU one day. Basically, he's the reason why Ukraine is a democratic country, contrary to neighboring Russia and Belarus, which during the same period were led by Putin and Lukashenko, two charismatic leaders who are bloody dictators now. So, in 2005, Ukraine was tired of ugly president and decided to elect a cute one, Viktor Yushchenko, who had a very pro-Western position. His opponent, the pro-Russian candidate Viktor Yanukovych, was basically a semi-literate guy who was in prison for rape and robbery. Yushchenko was clearly a more popular candidate and Russia started a dirty campaign to diminish him. They claimed that Yushchenko was a hidden Nazi and his father or grandfather was part of OUN slash UPA and that he is a CIA agent because of his wife who is American. All these campaigns failed, so they decided to fake the election and make a pro-Russian candidate win. Ukrainians were not ready with another retard president and made an orange revolution, basically a mass protest against Paul's election, which led to another round of fair elections where pro-European Yushchenko finally won. 
Russian government was deadly scared that people could protest fake election and one day the same could happen in Russia with Vladimir Putin and started to create an internal propaganda narrative that the original election were fair and that Orange Revolution was made up by CIA to give political power to the Ukrainian fascist and that Ukraine is now an American colony and something like this will never be allowed in Russia. That looked funny from Ukrainian side, but Russians generally bought the theory, specifically after Yushchenko openly called OUN heroes of Ukraine. Nonetheless, Yushchenko did not fulfill the expectation of political reforms, largely due to the parliament which was still controlled by pro-Russian opposition. As the result, he lost re-election in 2010 and his formal rival, semi-literate pro-Russian Yanukovych became a new president, which is crazy if you think about it. Russia was extremely happy to be able to regain political power in Ukraine, but Yanukovych was quite a tricky man. He was trying to pretend that he was also pro-European. Ukraine and the EU started a process of trade association agreement during Yushchenko times, and Yanukovych was promising to sign and continue pro-Western integration. But on the day when he actually had to sign it physically, Yanukovych refused to do this, saying that he changed his mind. Ukrainians clearly understood that it was Putin who told him not to sign and started the revolution of dignity, so-called Euromaidan, in 2014, demanding impeachment. As the result, Yanukovych fled to Russia and Ukraine literally lost its president. One of the principal groups who made this revolution possible was Right Sector which is alt-right direct descendant of OUN. This made Russia to claim that Nazis came into power in Ukraine as the result of illegitimate coup and Russia does not recognize the current administration. The real president is Yanukovych. If you look at the real facts, none of the right sector members got any political positions. Everything was done according to the Ukrainian constitution and the speaker of the house became the new acting president. Nonetheless, Russia continued to push the narrative about Nazi occupation and that Nazi SS battalions are about to come to Crimea to punish civilians for wanting to join Russia. And that was the initial official reason why Crimea was annexed. And probably there were some guys from the right sectors who claimed that they wanted to come to Crimea to make an order there, but they had zero political power and we have zero evidence of any such cases. In just a couple of months after the revolution, Yanukovych presidential terms were about to expire and the new presidential elections were scheduled. Petro Poroshenko, a pro-European politician, became a new president of Ukraine and the leader of the right sector got only 0.7% of the votes. Petro Poroshenko was a longtime politician and businessman and it was impossible for Russian propaganda to claim that he is a Nazi. Nonetheless, Russia didn't fully recognize the elections because they were made by Nazi transition in government and Ukraine is still controlled by Nazi. Secretly. Something like deep state. In the same time, Donbas separatist movement backed by Russia started. And as we know today, the goal was to take all eastern and thousand Ukraine and create a Russia puppet state, Novorossiya. Russia was actively pushing the campaign that neo-Nazi battalions are fighting against peaceful Donbas people who want to be independent. Now we are finally arriving to Azov and Aidar battalions. Back in 2014, the Ukrainian army was in complete disarray and was not ready to fight against Russian-backed separatists. Donbas war was completely unexpected and Ukraine was politically weak after the revolution. It is 100% true that ideology and symbols of Azov and Aidar are neo-Nazi and fascist. Then maybe Russian propaganda is actually true. Well, we live in postmodernism and it's not enough to declare yourself Nazi. You also need to behave like Nazi. And Nazi do war crimes against humanity like ethnic cleansing. There is a report about human rights violation in Donbass from Amnesty International. These guys are as left as possible. If there was some kind of a genocide or intentional killings of civilians, they would definitely mention that. Here you can read about tortures and ill treatment of civilians by Aidar and Azov. Tortures are illegal, but they were used by US government as well, and US government is not Nazi. There is nothing about killing civilians or any genocide in that report. And you can't really argue that they just didn't have a chance to do that because it was quite a dirty paramilitary war from both sides. They could do whatever they wanted, but they didn't. 
If you read about the abuses from separatist side in the same report, the complaints are pretty much the same. So, we have officially two Nazi battalions against anti-Nazi Donbas separatists. Yet, their behavior is pretty much the same according to Amnesty International, which is very postmodernistic, but we can experimentally confirm that Azov and Aidar are quite different from SS battalions from Nazi Germany. In addition, both Aidar and Azov were integrated into the regular army in 2015 and played according to the rules since then. No more official Nazi ideology. The size of Azo is 2,500 and Aidar was around 400, which is way less than 15,000 of UPA members who were responsible for Volin massacres back in 1943. Details like this are extremely important. But the Russian propaganda doesn't care and keep telling us that there was a genocide in Donbas for the last eight years and the whole world ignored it. Well, there was a war between separatists and Ukraine and 3,400 civilians died. Most of these people died between April 2014 and February 2015, where the active stage of the conflict happened. UN data claims only 350 civilian deaths from 2016 to 2021. Even the official data from separatists DNR and LNR claims only 8 civilian deaths in 2021 and 5 in 2020. The conflict was frozen and the claim of 8 years of genocide is just nonsense. Even the active stage from April 2014 to February 2015 was less destructive to the population than the current so-called Russian military operation. All the destruction and civilian deaths back then were happening along confrontation lines. Not like it's now that it's pretty much everywhere, specifically targeting infrastructure objects and randomly killing civilians. Some data show us that there are more than 3300 civilians deaths just after two and a half weeks of that war, which is almost the same as in Donbas for the last eight years. If you look at center of Donetsk right now, nothing much changed since the last eight years. Okay, today they had some kind of false flag operation, but look at Kharkiv, it's basically in rubble. I'm not even talking about Mariupol, which Putin wants to level completely to the ground because Azov is protecting the city. The only war which was going on for the last eight years was the propaganda one on Russian TV. Pretty much every day, every political talk show was talking about Ukraine and Donbas and a range of ridiculous fakes. Opposition politicians like Navalny were always criticizing that saying like, we live in Russia, not in Ukraine. Why do you always talk about it so much? His understanding was that Putin wanted to hide all the problems in the economy and switch the agenda to Ukraine. From the hindsight, we can say that it was a pure repetitive propaganda to convince Russian people that the current war is legitimate and needed. And it was done so well, even if you say that President Zelensky is a Jew, that one of the members of peace negotiation team David Arahamia is Georgian, or the head of Mykolaiv region, which is under the Russian siege right now, is ethnic Korean, it doesn't really matter for them. Ukraine is occupied by Nazi and SS battalions who are ready to kill every Russian. Thanks for watching, don't forget to like and subscribe and see you soon, bye!